Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Term 2 International Student Welcome event. My name is Gianna, and I am the cultural mentor and the MC for today. I'm a fourth year Bachelor of Chemical Engineering and Master's in Biomedical Engineering student here at UNSW, and I've been part of the UNSW Cultural Mentor Program for the past one year. I understand it has been a difficult couple of years for everyone, so it is quite fantastic to see so many of you here today. For those joining us virtually, we hope to see as many of you in person as soon as possible. There's quite a lot of information to cover today, but before we dive right into it, I'd like to introduce you to our Head of Student Life, Jessica, to officially welcome you to UNSW and to deliver the acknowledgement of country. A warm welcome to all of you joining us today. It's so wonderful seeing our international student community on campus again. Some of you may have attended the Welcome to Country this morning. As you may or may not be aware, there are differences between a Welcome to Country and an Acknowledgement of Country, which is important to understand whilst you're here in Australia. What is an Acknowledgement of Country? An Acknowledgement of Country is a way of showing awareness of and respect for the traditional custodians of the land upon which a meeting or event is to take place. It recognises the continuing connection of Aboriginal people to country and is commonly delivered by both Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. It is a practice that is commonly conducted at meetings or events within the university. Whereas a welcome of country is a ceremony performed by a local Aboriginal person of significance, usually an elder, to acknowledge and give consent to events taking place on their traditional lands. It is also a sign of respect and protocol, which dates back to the traditional times prior to colonisation. This distinctive difference has important cultural significance for Aboriginal peoples and should be observed carefully. So as customary here in Australia, and as a non-Indigenous person, I want to start off with an acknowledgement of country. I would like to show my respects and acknowledge the Bejigal, Gadjigal and Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land of which UNSW campuses stand and elders past and present on which this event takes place. Welcome to those of you who are just joining us. We are so excited to have you as part of our UNSW family and look forward to seeing you at our different events this week. Over the last few months, our Student Life team have been working tirelessly to make sure you start off with a bang by providing you with an action-packed and information-dense week for all our newly commencing international students. Hopefully this helps you smoothly transition into your new home here at UNSW and Sydney. To get the most out of this week, be sure to take part in as many on-campus and virtual activities as you can fit into your schedule. Today's presentation is filled with important information, which you will hopefully find helpful in guiding you in the first few weeks and beyond. With that being said, I'm gonna hand it back to Gianna, who will let you know what topics will be covered today. Thank you and all the best to your start to term. Thank you, Jessica. Just so you are aware, this event is being live streamed and the recording will be uploaded to the International Student Life page later this week. The topics we'll be covering today are visa information, health and well-being, student support and staying safe, student conduct and integrity, student life and our student offerings. After this one hour presentation, we encourage you to follow our peer mentors to the International Student Welcome Center where you can enjoy some free snacks and stalls where you can find out more about topics that you may or may not have heard during this event. We also have a nice surprise at the end for those joining us in person, so make sure you stick around for the announcement at the end. Throughout the presentation, you will see some QR codes where you can find out more information about certain sections that you may find particularly useful, such as the one to the, on the slide to our International Student Life page. So I thought it'd be helpful to start us off with a short quiz to see how much you might know and how it'll also help you understand about the different acronyms, terms and facts that are commonly used at UNSW. If you could please all scan the QR code and it will take you to our short quiz. 
Alternatively, you can also visit the Slido website on the screen and enter it in the code. Okay, so the answer to the first question is confirmation of enrollment, which means your CAE is issued to you by the UNICEF admissions, and it is required in order to get your student visa to verify that you are enrolled into a course at UNSW. So actually the answer is false, because although this event is for international students and study abroad and exchange students, international students refers to those completing their full degree and graduating from UNSW, whereas study abroad and exchange students are completing part of their degree at UNSW and graduating from their home university overseas. We will let you know if, about any information today if it differs for study abroad and exchange students here with us. Right, so the main answer is the Kensington, Paddington, Sydney, CBD, and Canberra is our main UNSW campuses. While the Kensington is the main one, Paddington is home to the UNSW School of Art and Design, and the Sydney CBD campus is in the heart of the financial district, and the Canberra campus is located at the Australian Defence Force Academy in our nation's capital. So this is a common fact that every student needs to know. So UAC stands for units of credit, and as an international student, you're expected to enroll in a full load of study, which means, which Matthew will go into more detail later in this presentation in the visa information section. So located on the level three of the main library, these sleeping pods will deliver the ultimate sleep experience when you need to some rest and can't make it back home in between classes. Inuli will tell you more about taking care of your health and well-being while studying here at UNSW. So studying here at UNSW, let me share a few of my tips that I've been using so far for, to study effectively as it can be quite challenging at first. Firstly, developing a routine. With in-person classes, commute, events, and so much more, it is easy for us to do whatever we want and forget our priorities. A routine helps with building habits and making studying easier. For example, setting a designated study time allows you to be more focused during that period and also allows that you ensure, also ensures that you review class material so that you are staying on track of your studies. Having said that, engaging in communities and events on campus is fun as well. There are lots of societies here at UNSW and you can join them for events, freebies and meet like-minded people. ARC is a really good starting point and Mitch will elaborate more on what they do at the end of this event. Apart from societies, you can befriend your classmates, chat with them during breaks, and hang out after class. If you live on campus, engaging in college activities and getting to know your neighbors would be a great way to start. Explore the campus in your own time. The UNSW campus is beautiful and there are lots of hidden places for you to explore. Be sure to go around the campus in your own time, sit on one of the lawns to have lunch, find your favorite food on campus, and talk to new people. 
The Universe and Lost on Campus are the two apps UNSW students use to find their way around campus. And if you haven't already, make sure you jump on a Yellow Shirts tour during a week to help familiarize yourself and find your classrooms before term starts next week. Studying can be quite hard, especially when you're transitioning from high school to work or, or work to university, while also studying in your second language. UNSW has various resources you can access to stay on top of your studies and maintain a good mental health. For example, the UNSW library not only provides textbooks, but also hosts workshops on academic writing and presentation skills. Student societies also have various peer mentoring programs that allows you to connect with students in higher years. And one of the most important resources is Wi-Fi. UniWide is a Wi-Fi we use, and it is pretty simple to set up. You just need your ZID and ZPass to verify your account. You can also connect to the EduRoam Wi-Fi, which will allow you to use the internet connection at teaching places outside of the UNS Assembly campus, such as the hospital precinct. All in all, take your time, establish your own study routine, and make the most of your experience here on campus by participating in different activities. The platforms used for courses vary depending on the lecturer and faculty, but include Blackboard Collaborate, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom. Be sure to check your Moodle course page and student email to see which platforms your lecturer will be using. If you're unfamiliar with these platforms, I encourage you to visit the UNSW ID website using the QR code or instruct for instructions on how to use them. Another important part of learning is communicating with your course instructors. The main ways of contacting them are via email or Moodle forums. The forums are frequently used at UNSW as they allow you another way to have discussions with your classmates and course coordinators in addition to face-to-face -face classes. If you haven't had a chance to explore outside of campus yet, there are some important things you should know regarding public transport around Sydney. All international study abroad and exchange students are eligible for an adult Opal card only, not a student or concession Opal card. You can also pay with a contactless bank card, a card that you can pay by tapping, or a digital wallet on the Opal reader on buses, trains, light rails, and ferries. Make sure you tap off using the same card that you tapped on with. Make sure you tap on and off every time, as failure to do so will result in a maximum charge for the day. You may also be fined by a transport officer if you do not tap on, as they can see your day's tra travel activity with the re their reader on an Opal card as well as your bank card. Light rail and buses are the best modes to transport to your campus. The L2 right light rail will take you to upper campus, while the L3 light rail will take you to lower campus. Make sure you wave down the bus that you'd like to get on, otherwise it may continue on without you, even though the stop is on their route. There is likely a few buses that go to that stop, so you will need to indica indicate to the driver that you'd like to get on the bus. Apps such as Opal Travel or TripView are the best in figuring out how to get around Sydney. Also know that Opal is used in and around Sydney area. If you're looking to travel regionally around the state or interstate, you will need to purchase an alternative ticket or transit card. Moving on, I'm going to introduce the Cultural Mentor Program to you all. We, the Cultural Mentors, are a group of experienced local and international students from diverse backgrounds. The program aims to help international students like you with transitioning into study at UNSW, whether you're onshore or offshore. As a culture mentors, we try our best to make you feel at home here at UNSW while answering your university-related questions or concerns and providing you with one-on-one -on -one peer mentoring. If this sounds helpful to you, you can apply to become a mentee by scanning the QR code here and answering a few questions about yourself. We will then match you with a mentor that is most suitable for you in terms of what you're looking for. You can have one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions with them afterwards and participate in Fort Lightney casual social events to, get to meet more people. Make sure you check your email and join as many activities as you can to get the most out of this experience. To support you in your new life in Sydney and at UNSW, we encourage you to visit the International Student Welcome Center, where a friendly culture mentor will take you through all the important things you need to know as an international student studying here in Australia. The Welcome Center is open from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m., Monday to Friday until the 2nd of June, which is week one of this term. There are some events coming up, such as speed friending and toad back painting, so scan the QR code and reserve your spot. We hope to see you there. I will now hand it over to Nuli to talk to you about how you can make sure to take care of your health and well-being. Hi, 
everyone, I'm Inuli, and I'm the Health and Wellbeing Coordinator for this year. I'm also doing my honors year in neuroscience. Um, so my job is to help students on campus know how to stay healthy and well so that they can make the most out of their university experience. Health and Wellbeing Ambassadors are part of the health promotions team, and we support UNSW students to make informed and healthy choices, support their friends, and contribute to the well-being of the communities in which they learn and live. Becoming a part of health and well-being was really important to me because it was my way of helping other students really succeed at university while also breaking down some of the barriers that many students face while, when it comes to getting the help they need. As an international student myself, I understand that maintaining your health isn't always a priority when you first arrive. You're focusing on making friends, having a good time, and also on your studies. But adjusting to life in Australia is challenging, and it's not always easy. One way to ensure you are successful is to actually look after your well-being. And it is proven that students with a higher level of well-being actually do better academically. Some of the well-being tips that I like to follow are getting a good seven to nine hours of sleep, which I know is really difficult as a university student, student but it does make a huge difference. Eating a healthy, balanced diet with lots of natural, unprocessed foods, being active for at least 30 minutes every day, staying connected, calling your parents back home or your friends, and practicing mindfulness. So taking breaks and having some downtime, especially during exam season. Here's a video on all the health resources available to you on campus. The UNSW Health Service is a comprehensive health service that's available to all students and staff at the university. Healthcare systems around the world vary greatly from country to country, so here's a brief overview of how the Australian health system works. If you're feeling unwell or have a minor injury, your first point of contact is a general practitioner or a GP who works at a health service or doctor's surgery. Australian GPs have extensive training and experience in treating many different types of illnesses and injuries, which may be treated by specialists or emergency wards in other countries. If the GP can't provide the treatment you need, they'll refer you on to a specialist. Specialist appointments can only be made with a referral letter written by a GP. It's important to remember though, if you're experiencing a life-threatening medical emergency, you should call 000 or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. At the UNSW Health Service, we have a team of highly experienced GPs who can provide a range of medical services. We can treat everything from general health issues and sports injuries to heart problems. We can also conduct men's and women's health checks and provide vaccinations for health and travel. Making an appointment with us is easy. You can book a time via our online booking system through the UNSW Health Service website or through the Appoint You It app, which you can download on your phone. You can also come in and speak to our staff in person. All appointments with us are completely confidential and the health service does not link or share your personal records with the university. For domestic students who hold a Medicare card or international students with a Medibank OSHC card or AHM card, there is no cost to see a GP. A small fee may be charged for some vaccinations and dressings if needed. If you are an international student with other health insurance funds, you may need to pay upfront and be reimbursed later by your health insurer. On the day of your appointment, you can find us on the ground floor of the Quadrangle at the Kensington campus. Please check in with reception and present your UNSW ID card and a Medicare or health insurance card. As an international student, the GP-centred model of care here in Australia might be something that we're not used to back in our home countries. But what I really like about the UNSW Health Service here is that the doctors are really actively involved in our personal health and well-being and even going the extra mile to call us after hours to check in on how we're doing. It's great to be able to see the doctor instead of going straight to the hospital. And um, I was so relieved that I found out everything is covered by overseas student healthcare insurance. The UNSW Health Service prides itself on patient confidentiality and that means that students like ourselves can feel comfortable speaking freely with the doctors and uh, staff there on any physical or mental health issues that we might have. The health service is really convenient because it's um, located on campus 
and um, I can see the doctor straight away without needing a referral. They really just want to help you out and make sure that you're well looked after. So remember, if you have any concerns about your health or well-being, come in and see our friendly staff. As international students, we all have OSHC, and at UNSW, Medibank is our preferred OSHC. They provide you with medical cover for general health issues and emergencies. Medibank will have a store down at the International Student Welcome Center where you can speak to them if you do have any questions. Now I'll play a video on beach and ocean safety. Australia has some of the best beaches in the world and everybody loves going to the beach. But there's something on the beach called rip currents. Rips are something that every Australian and every overseas tourist should know about because there's something that can get you into trouble. I'm Dr. Rob Brander from the University of New South Wales, and I'm a surf scientist and surf lifesaver. During the summer months in Australia, on average, somebody drowns in a rip every two or three days, and most of the thousands of rescues that happen on our beaches are related to rips. Remember that it only takes about a minute to drown, so it's very important to be able to spot rips on your own. Now, if you haven't noticed, I've been swimming between the flags, and that's where everybody should swim because the lifesavers and the lifeguards put the flags in the safest part of the beach away from the rips. And if you don't know what a rip is, if you swim between the flags, that takes a lot of the guesswork out of having to spot one. However, of the more than 11,000 beaches in Australia, only 3% are actually patrolled by surf lifesavers and lifeguards. And that means there's a lot of beaches and a lot of rips that you could easily get into trouble in. Well, what are rips? It's a really good question. And what we do is we throw purple dye, which is harmless, into the water. The dye goes wherever the water goes, and it's an easy way to spot the rip. Well, let me tell you what rips are not. They're not undertow. They won't pull you under because there's no such thing as an undertow. They're not rip tides because they're not a tide. They're a current. They flow pretty steady, and they won't take you to New Zealand. Basically, rips are strong, narrow currents that flow from the shoreline through the surf zone and offshore. They exist to take all the breaking water that's piling up on the beach back out to sea. Here you see a nice green gap, almost like a road going through the surf. And that's the rip current because it's sitting in a deeper channel, in this case, between the reef and the sandbar. But look at it, there's no waves breaking, there's hardly any white water. Whereas you look to the right, you've got your sandbar, shallow water, waves are breaking there, bringing all that water in and back out through the rip. It looks perfect, and that's how you spot it. It's a pretty scary experience getting stuck in a rip, and there's definitely some do's and don'ts about how you should behave if you do find yourself caught in one. The main thing is not to panic. Don't panic, because the rip will not pull you under the water. All the rip will do will take you further out to sea, and it will sometimes bring you back. Remember that you've got air in your lungs, you float, you're very buoyant, so don't panic. The second thing to do is, if you're not a particularly good swimmer, put your hand up, straight up like that, signals for the lifeguards and the lifesavers to come and get you. What you could also do if you're a good swimmer is you could look around. And if you can see the sides of the rip, which is usually the shallower water where the waves are breaking, a lot of white water, swim towards that area. White water is good because it means it's shallow, you can maybe stand up, and also white water brings you back to the beach. What you should never do is swim against the rip. These things flow pretty fast, and you'll just find yourselves going backwards, swimming faster, getting tired, and then you'll start to get scared. So just go with the flow, signal for the lifeguard, or let the rip take you around and get out of it yourself. One of the reasons that rips are dangerous is that they flow faster than people can swim, and sometimes they can flow faster than even Olympic swimmers. Rips are most dangerous because they actually look like the safest place to swim. A view from a headland is always a good way to spot a rip because you're up high and you're looking down at the beach and they're a lot easier to see. And often surfers and swimmers will check out the beach for rips before they go down in the water. Not all rips are the same. The most common type is what we call a fixed rip. And fixed rips are stuck between sandbars and they might stay in the same place for days, weeks, and even months. Well, we've just had an example of a flash rip where all of a sudden the rip is pulsed out. Where those surfers are, you can see the, the chopped up, messy white water that's just gone out and then it's just stopped. And that's one, one common thing about these flash rips is that they can suddenly occur anywhere where there's suddenly been a large group of waves breaking and it pushes the rip out and then it disappears. Finally, we get something called a permanent rip or a headland rip. And these are rips that are pushed against the headland and they're there almost all the time. So it's another good reason to always be careful when you're swimming close to headlands and rocks. If there's no lifeguards or flags on the beach, the simple rule is don't go in. If you do go in, make sure you're an experienced swimmer or surfer 
Make sure you're always with somebody and make sure you know how to spot rips. A really fun program we have at Health and Wellbeing is the Learn to Swim program. It's eight weeks and it's only $75 for the entire eight weeks. So scan the QR code if you want to book a spot. We are also recruiting for Health and Wellbeing Ambassadors, so they are our amazing volunteers that help us promote all of these amazing things we do at UNSW. You also get AHEGS and free mental health first aid training. It's also a great way to meet, meet like-minded students on campus and just make friends. So you can scan the QR code again if you're interested. Some of our upcoming events are Project Mind, which is an eight-week developmental program. Um, we also have Talk Campus and May Measurement Month. If you come down to the Welcome Center after this, I'll be there at the stall to talk more about these events. Also make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Next, I'll pass it on to Nicole. Thank you. Hey, so afternoon everyone, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone in the room and those joining us online to UNSW. Uh, my name is Nicole, as Inule introduced, I am a student support advisor from UNSW Student Support. Um, today in my presentation, I will first introduce student support services, what we could do for our students, and then I will provide in important information on um, some other support services on campus and safety. So here at UNSW, we value students' well-being and welfare, and we provide students with great support services. We encourage all of our students to reach out, seek support, advice when they have questions and they experience challenges. Um, I would say um, at some point your student journey might be a little bit bumpy but shouldn't be lonely. So let's meet the student support team. So we are a team of eight student support advisors. Uh, we provide personalized advice and we work with all of our students uh, to uh, develop important skills um, so they can navigate um, the university and they can um, be successful. Um, our services are free and confidential, so which means your conversation with us stay with us, okay? And there are three ways for you to access our service. The first one is the drop-in services. So we provide drop-in services and it is usually for quick questions, questions that can be addressed in 10 to 15 minutes. And we provide uh, the face-to-face -face drop-in service at the Nuclear Student Hub, and we also provide a virtual drop-in on Microsoft Teams. And the second way is to book a longer session with us. So if you have um, more complicated requests or if you require ongoing support, um, I would recommend you to book a longer session with us. The longer session means it runs about 30 minutes to 45 minutes and you should uh, booking with us in advance, okay? And the third way is to send us email. Um, you can send us email whenever, wherever, but you also need to understand uh, we can only address uh, emails in three to five business days and sometimes it may take longer if it's during our peak time. So it is important for you to, write, to choose the right way to access our service. You can also scan the QR code to get on our page to know more details. What we could do for our students. So we consider for most students, the first term or even the first year is very crucial. We consider it is the transitioning period. Why is that? 
because you may need time to adjust to a new social, cultural, linguistic environment. And you also hear alone by yourself, away from your parents and your friends. Your education system in your country might be different with what here in Australia. And we, as the university and also your teachers, have expectations on you. And it's important for you to understand those expectations and how to meet those expectations, okay? And UNSW is such a big organization and can be very hard to navigate. So what we could do, we can um, um, actually um, help you to understand school policies and procedures, and we can assist you with um, cultural and university life adjustments. Um, we can also provide you with referrals if we consider you need other support services, okay? Um, also, we can provide support on students' personal, family, financial, accommodation, and work-related matters. As international students, you're all holding the international student visa, and we can also help students to address your questions about your student visa, okay? And finally, we can also assist you within your faculty. Accommodation options. So, um, as the international students, so living in a stable, um, affordable, and uh, reasonable quality accommodation, it's, it's important to everyone. It's important to your welfare, so it is important to your studies. And there are quite a lot of options. So the first one would be on-campus accommodation. And also off-campus, we have purposely built student accommodation like SCAPE, Igloo, Unilodge. We also um, have homestay, okay, and private rental. So you can see a lot of the resources on uh, UNSW Study Stay website. And uh, finally, that's the community living. So on the slide, there are two barcodes. The one on the right, if you scan it, it will lead you to off-campus accommodation information. And the barcode on the left, you scan it, it will lead you to on-campus accommodation information. What we could do in terms of accommodation requests, okay? So we can um, discuss with students on accommodation options, and we can also um, assist with the need for crisis accommodation. So if you um, have a complaint about a provider or you have issues on a UNSW study state, you can email us. Um, we can also provide, or I would say, we can also link you with free legal support services if that's what you need. For example, like ARC Legal, like Redfern Legal Center, and Kingsford Legal Center. All right. Um, so it is a very exciting time, studying university, making new friends. Um, I would say the last thing on your mind would be, oh, I may get sick or I may feel stressful. Um, but that, that could happen at some time. And it is also important for you to understand where you can go to when needed, okay? So um, here on campus, um, there are a lot of friendly staff who can help support students' well-being. Um, for mental health, the best place to start at UNSW would be Mental Health Connect. So their service is still confidential for free, and you can talk to the people um, about what's going on, about your feelings, and they can also link you with the best service provider. Um, here, the second one, it is the 24-7 mental health support line, which means you can talk to a mental health professional uh, when it's not during our business hour, okay? So we, you can call them, you can also send them a text. The next service I want to introduce to you is the equitable learning service. 
So if you have ongoing or temporary physical or psychological condition, and you can register with equitable learning and they can provide you with education adjustments. Those are special settings in the classroom and also special settings for your assessments and your exams. I highly recommend, okay? So if that's your case, you register with equitable learning service, the sooner the better. The closest the hospital to the UNSW Kensington campus is the Prince of New South Wales. Uh, you can visit their emergency department or you can call triple zero um, to be sent to the hospital by ambulance. So let's move on to talk about a safety. So I, I need to say first that a Sydney is a, safe count, uh, it's a safe city and a UNSW is a safe campus. But it's still important for you to know all the um, emergency number so I recommend you to bring out your phone and take a photo shot, um, take a screenshot of this page, please. Great, all done. All right, so next I'm gonna show you a video about UNSW on-campus security and a wonderful mobile phone app we created and it's called Stay Safe at UNSW. Welcome to the University of New South Wales. Your safety is our top priority and we want you to have a great experience while you are on campus. You can visit our security office 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, located at Gate 2. We developed the Stay Safe at UNSW app so you can easily access emergency contacts and information about what to do in the event of an emergency on campus. The app also helps you keep track of the security bus and locate help points, which provide a direct link to security services who can help you with questions or provide you with a safety escort. Our safety escort service is free and available to all students and staff. They can accompany you across campus, to your car or to a nearby address. You can request a safety escort via the app using a help point visit the security office at gate 2 or call 93856 000. If you're working or studying alone, you can use the work alone feature to check in on you at predetermined intervals. If you miss a check-in, your emergency contact will get a text message letting them know. Your emergency contact can either try to get in contact with you or call campus security to make sure you're okay. If you're in need of support, you can contact the Student Support Advisors, the Mental Health Connect Team, or the Employee Assistance Program by selecting Support Resources from the landing page. You can also use the app to send your location to a friend so they can track your journey in real time. The Friends Walk feature will send your friend a notification when you start your journey. Once you reach your destination, your friend will be notified that you have arrived safely. In the case of an emergency, press the emergency button to alert your friend that you need assistance from campus security or emergency services. For an emergency, you can contact security via the security app. It is important to notify security services if you are a victim of crime or witness suspicious behavior. You can report a crime via the app in person or calling security services. Your safety is our number one priority. Remember, you can visit us at Gate 2 and download the Stay Safe at UNSW app to access all of our security services. The app is free to download from the App Store or Google Play. Critical incident policy. So UNSW's critical incident policy outlines what UNSW will do if students are involved in a serious incident. UNSW security um, will work with senior manager within the university to manage the incident. We contact the students, affected students or their emergency contacts. Also, if a incident or if a major incident happens on campus, 
and we going to contact affected students via sending them a message, okay? Which means it is important for you to keep your contact details and also your emergency contact details up to date in my UNSW. It is also your visa condition. Okay, so if you become a victim of crime on campus, it is important for you to report it to UNSW campus security, um, who can help put you in contact with New South Wales police and also on campus uh, support services. Um, also, you need to understand um, there are other helpful um, external um, or we say community support services that might be helpful. Um, and um, you can contact them and they can either put you in contact with the right person or provide you with free counseling. You also need to remember um, their service are confidential, okay? And you can find all their contact details on the Stay Safe at UNSW app. Scams, okay. So unfortunately, international students are targets of scams and it's a very serious issue here in Sydney. So that's why I want to bring it up um, to um, alert everyone here, okay. So there are some golden rules, okay. Um, so basically, uh, you need to um, stay vigilant, okay. So you need to understand there are scams. And it is important for you to um, not click on links if it is sent via message or email. Even it seems like someone you can trust, okay? For example, if you receive an email from your bank asking you to click a link, it is safer to go to the official website of the bank and to see if that's the case, rather than click the link, okay? If it's a phone call from unknown number, it is better for you to not answer it. But also, I don't want you guys to miss important information from someone, um, could possibly be someone from the university. So um, if you feel not safe to answer the call, it is important for you to set up your voicemail and you listen to your voicemail, okay? Um, and also, you need to understand um, there's no way in Australia that someone would legitimately ask you for your personal information or the phone or email or text message or ask you to transfer that money, okay? That's not possible. So you need to remember that. No matter who they say they are, okay? They say they're the policeman, they're the prosecutor, they're the, the person from the immigration office, um, they, they're the person from university, okay? So there's always, always the time for you to cool down, to process the information, to verify the information. So please do not take any immediate action, no immediate action, and instead you go to the person you trust and to ver verify, okay? It's very important for you to understand that. Okay, and scan the QR code, please, because here at UNSW, we, we put up great information on scams, so you can just scan the QR code and go to the page and to see what's going on right now, okay? Also, if you think something is suspicious or if you see something suspicious, it's important for you to report to UNSW campus security. And finally, why I want to bring it up, is because um, this virtual kidnapping um, in April for the past month, um, the New South Wales Police received uh, four reported cases. And this particular type of scam targeting international Chinese students has been causing great financial loss and psychological trauma on those victims, okay? So it started with a call, someone calling you, pretending to be a policeman or a prosecutor, 
and saying you're going to be deported if you're not transferring that money. If you transfer them the money, the case further escalated and they asked you to fake your own kidnap and then took a photo and sent the photo to your family and asked a ransom from your family, okay? So if you encounter that situation, hang up, do not listen to them. Talk to a student support advisor or talk to New South Wales police um, or reach out to your embassy or uh, you know, talk to someone you trust, okay? So it's serious, it's important, and it's, it's very crucial for you to understand. Okay, now I'm going to hand it over to Matthew from UNSW Compliance Team to talk about uh, important visa information. Okay, thanks very much, Nicole. Hello, everyone, good afternoon. It's great to see you all here. Congratulations from me as well. So I work within the student compliance team and the information that I'm gonna be giving you today is particular to your student visa, okay? So different rights and responsibilities and things that you need to be aware of while you're here on study. So some of this, it looks as if you already know because we put those little Slido quiz at the start and um, most of you were getting the answers correct there. So in terms of the main thing that you need to know about your, your student visa is that you all have a, a COE, a confirmation of enrollment. And you need to have a valid COE at all times. So um, the COE contains information about what you're studying. So the program code, the duration of study, when you're expected to, to complete your studies in that program. Um, you need to enroll in what's called a full load of study as an international student visa holder. That works out as being 48 units of credit each year. So for those of you taking postgraduate coursework or undergraduate studies, typically one course is six units of credit. Um, so the way people will split that is they have to take eight courses a year. So that would be three courses in their first term, then another three courses, and then two courses in the third term in that academic year. Um, the minimum you can be enrolled in to be compliant with a full load of study is 12 units of credit in one standard study period. Okay? Um, if you are here in the study abroad and exchange program, you need to be enrolled based on your specific study plan that's already been finalized in the Endeavor platform, okay? So you're looking at that rather than the number of courses and, and the full study load. There's only a couple of um, circumstances by which the university would be able to approve you extending the duration of your study. It might be something like if you were to transfer into another program which had a longer study duration, or let's say there was um, a chance where you, an, an, a situation happened where you had to take program leave and then you wouldn't be able to complete by the same end date in your study, um, then that is something to be aware of because there would be then changes or impacts on your, your COE and possibly your, your student visa as well. UNSW has an academic standing policy, so it's something that we recommend you take note of. You can find it by logging into MyUNSW, and then you can read through what the policy entails. The idea is that you're meant to be making satisfactory progress in terms of passing the courses as you go through each term. Okay? If it happens that you're not making satisfactory progress, then the university will be writing to you, inviting you to come along to an interview or a, a consultation with an academic advisor, or possibly one of the student support team as well, like um, Nicole, who was just speaking to you before. Some more student visa responsibilities, things that you have to do under the terms of your student visa. You need to inform UNSW of your accommodation, like your current residential address. <laughs> residential address now that you're here in Australia. Um, if you're staying somewhere temporarily, 
Um, once you've found a permanent long-term address, within the next seven days, we'd ask that you log into MyUNSW, and then you update the address details there, um, your contact details, that means your mobile number, and also a, a personal email address. So please make sure you do that. If you don't, during the term, um, we can pick up on that, and we'll be sending emails asking you to, um, to update those changes. We talked a little bit already about needing to have OSHC, Overseas Student Healthcare. Again, that's a requirement of your student visa. If you're a student under the age of 18, you need to be aware of the, um, the specific arrangements and accommodation and welfare agreement that has been made to you as part of your, your offer of study here at UNSW. And that means attending things like um, this student welcome here today and um, the, um, the under 18 welcome event that we have this week as well. Also, your work rights are part of your student visa conditions, and there's a separate information on the next slide that I'll talk about next. Over the last couple of years, obviously, there's student um, studies have looked very different for people as they've been impacted by COVID-19 and the pandemic in different ways. But the Australian government agency that's responsible for higher education, um, as we're making some changes in terms of getting back to um, what we're calling getting back to compliance. From term two for you, so from next week, the 29th of May, these are the changes that you have to be aware of in terms of your study and your student visa. You need to be here in person in Sydney studying. So um, all of you here in the room, that's one that you've ticked off already. Um, we know there's still some people um, offshore trying to get here as soon as they can. Um, yeah, the idea is that from the start of week one, you should be here in person ready to commence your studies. You need to be enrolled in at least one in-person course each term, and you can't take any more than one-third of courses from your degree in online mode. So these are the big main three points to be aware of, and the university is going to be monitoring these as well, and anyone who doesn't meet these three criteria, um, there's going to be correspondence and emails, communication being sent out to students, um, notifying you that you need to make some changes to your, to your enrollment so that you're compliant with the, the student visa conditions. Because otherwise, you're at risk of your COE being cancelled after the census date, which is a breach of your student visa, okay? So um, please, when you're thinking about your enrollment, get the right advice from your faculty, you, know, you can look um, in the online handbook or you can go and get some advice from the teams in the nucleus and make sure that you're enrolled appropriately in the right courses to complete your degree on time. In terms of work rights, currently there's no limits um, under the student visa about how often an international student can work. This is something that was put in place by the government um, to acknowledge that there's quite a few industries in Australia that rely on international students to, to prop up the workforce. But from the 1st of July, um, work restrictions are coming back into place. Um, they've raised the limit from what it used to be, and um, it's now going to be capped at an increased rate of 48 hours a fortnight. So you'd be able to work on a student visa in a period of two weeks, you could work 48 hours. Being here on a student visa means that that's your primary reason for being here. So doing something like altering your enrollment or you know, if you were to get in a position where you're, you're failing to meet the academic progress requirements of your course in order to work more or to work full time, that's, um, it's really not advisable to be doing something like that. So be aware of what the restrictions are and when they come into place. Um, our team in student compliance, we can also assist if your studies have been impacted by COVID-19 to the point where 
you needed to apply for a new student visa, you can um, be assessed to see if you're eligible for the COVID-1545, um, the 1545 form, the visa fee waiver form. Um, in terms of support for all of you in your first few days or the, the week in Australia, um, we'd encourage all of you to get along to the, the Welcome Center that we talked a little bit about before, and there's a, um, more information at the end of the talk today about what you can, you can get from there. There's information and support as you transition to you know, life on campus, but also meeting experienced students who are here to help you out and give you information about what it's like adjusting to life and study here on campus at, at UNSW. The last slide I have for you is talking about key dates to be aware of um, now that you're here and about to start in term two, okay? So we made the distinction before between international students and those that are here on study abroad and exchange. So for the international students here in the room, the deadline coming up is at the end of week one on Sunday the 4th of June. Um, just before midnight, it's the deadline to add or swap courses in terms of what you're enrolled in for your, your first term. After that, you wouldn't be able to make any changes to your, your study. Those of you doing exchange and study abroad, um, there's a deadline coming up very soon. So 22nd of May, that's today, 5 o'clock. That's the deadline for any new course approvals. So if you haven't finalized anything, you really need to um, get onto that very quickly. And then your deadline for making changes to enrollment and class times is um, the end of week one, Sunday 4th of June. Census date is a date to be aware of. Um, it's a government mandated date during the term. And if you're going to be making any changes to what you're studying, it's advisable to get those changes in the system and requested prior to census date. Because if you make them afterwards, there's, um, it can have an impact in terms of the tuition fees that you incur and also on your, um, your academic record as well. So if you're going to drop any courses or you needed to take program leave, you should be looking at doing that prior to census date, which is Sunday, 25th of June. Um, later in the term, there's also the academic census date. You can, by which date, you're able to drop courses without an academic penalty when it comes to your, your transcript. Um, then later on, the, the last day of study during the term, Friday, 4th of August, um, you're still able to drop a course rather than fail it, but the grade shows up on your record as um, an AW, academic withdrawal. Um, study abroad and exchange students, you're not permitted to be dropping courses or you know, making changes during, during your visit to, to UNSW unless there are specific extenuating circumstances. And in those cases, we'd be encouraging you to um, speak with one of the advisors from um, study abroad and exchange. And the email address that you have up there um, international.student at UNSW. Um, questions about, you know, your COE or things like that, you can address them to um, the team there and then you get a response, okay? So that's everything that I've got to let you know about today. But once again, welcome and we wish you all the best in your studies this term. I'm going to pass over to Matt from the um, Student Conduct and Integrity Office. Thanks, everyone. Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome to UNSW. A very warm welcome to everybody joining us in person and online. So my name is Matt, and I'm a case manager with the Conduct and Integrity Office. So unlike my fantastic colleagues, have you have heard from earlier today, you actually won't want to be seeing me again. Why, my team is responsible for managing and uh, investigating misconduct matters. Simply put, 
this means that uh, this means cheating and other forms of wrongdoing, something that UNSW does take extremely seriously. If we meet again, it's likely because you've been caught doing something wrong, and that probably isn't a great thing. Last year, or in the last 12 months, our team saw upwards of 2,000 incidences of misconduct across the university. It's important that you have a clear understanding from day one of how you can avoid misconduct and cheating and avoid really serious consequences. The most common types of misconduct we see include plagiarism, contract cheating, and unauthorized communication. So as you can see up there, plagiarism is probably the most common form of misconduct that we see. It means copying someone's work, and this could be in an, any form of assignment, so video assignments, written assignments, online assignments, and it means copying either directly, or it could be copying the concept or ideas of other people without appropriate referencing. Self-plagiarism is also considered a form of serious misconduct. So if you've written a piece of work before for another assignment, or if you've even written one in high school, you aren't allowed to copy your own work without referencing it. You can certainly use your own concepts and things, it just has to be referenced. Contracts cheating is something we've also seen a really serious rise in, and it's something that we're very concerned about and, and uh, take very seriously. It can also be called ghostwriting, and it means paying or asking someone or a third party, a business, an organization, to complete an assignment or sit an exam on your behalf. So what it means is essentially you're not the one completing the work that you're submitting under your name. Contract cheaters often advertise on social media, so especially on WhatsApp and WeChat, and there are often posters on campus which may advertise things like tut uh, tutoring or um, services that guarantee really high grades. They can often pretend to be tutors or pretend to be study helpers, and you've got to be really cautious because it can get you in a lot of trouble. Using services such as Chegg, Bilibili, Course Hero are some of the big ones that we see, where you pay a fee to have certain questions answered or pay to have someone, um, pay to obtain someone else's assignment that's completed the course before, is also considered contract cheating. So be very careful about these services that um, claim to be legitimate, it's very rarely the case. Unauthorized communication is another common mistake that we see, and it just means communicating with others. Usually this is in an exam. So we'll see that students are completing an exam, either online and in person, and they'll be talking to other students in that exam. Um, we've had big groups of students, so groups of, you know, even upwards of 50 students caught um, when an exam is online using services like Discord, WhatsApp, or WeChat to communicate with others, posting, exam uh, posting questions and answers during an exam. That's really strictly um, off limits, and you certainly should not be doing it. Um, so what happens if you do make a mistake in your court? Well, it may seem like what you're doing is harmless, but what you're doing is at cheating and can have really serious lifelong consequences. An analogy I like to use is, would you like to drive across a bridge that has been built by an engineer that didn't complete their own work? Would you like to be operated on by a doctor that hadn't completed their assignments by themselves or had plagiarized their content? It, exactly the same goes in all different professions. It can be really quite a serious offense. The penalties for misconduct at UNSW, so cheating, can be as serious as suspension or even permanent exclusion. So that means you're not allowed to study at the university anymore. We've seen numerous cases of students losing their scholarships, which means that you um, have to essentially pay all the money that uh, you obtained in the scholarship back. We've seen students excluded from the university and subsequently have their COE cancelled, which means their visa would be cancelled. So we can have really serious consequences on your enrolment and your student visa potentially. We can investigate at any time, even after you've graduated. We have revoked degrees of students numerous times when, we've, when technology has improved and we've been able to detect their cheating after they've graduated. So that means if you've cheated, choose to cheat, 
a year or two down the line, uh, we discover that you've done something wrong in your degree, your degree will be revoked and you'd have to come and sit those courses again. So, um, and that has happened quite a few times before and it, it's worth noting that technology does improve all the time. We're getting better at detecting things, technology is improving and essentially it can happen at any time. So how can you avoid these mistakes? Honestly, it's easier than you think. If you're in doubt, if you're having trouble, if you have any questions about your assignment or think you can't complete it, talk to your teacher or talk to any of the support services um, available at UNSW. Um, the support services such as UNSW Psychology and Wellness are fantastic to help when students are stressed or you're feeling stressed or anxious around um, your studies. Um, I also think um, the student support advisors can help you with study techniques or other management techniques if you're having issues. Um, to avoid plagiarism, it's very important you familiarise yourself with Harvard referencing and how to reference appropriately. Again, the easiest way to avoid plagiarism is just to do that referencing. You can use other people's work and you're expected to use other um, sources in your assignments, but you just have to reference it properly. It's strictly, it's worth noting too, it's really strictly against UNSW's code of conduct to give your login details to anybody else. You're not allowed to give them to your family, your friends, another business, certainly not. Um, it, that can have extremely serious penalties as well. Um, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So if there's a service online that offers high grades or guarantees high marks or that they'll, they can do an assignment for you, don't believe them. Don't believe messages from strangers on social media, WhatsApp, WeChat. It's probably a scam and you'll lose lots of money and probably in be in trouble with the university. Don't ever post your assessments, questions or answers online. Avoid sharing study notes and assessments even with close friends and classmates because that can also lead to findings of misconduct against you if they use your work improperly. And also pay very close attention to exam rules. Something that we're seeing at the moment is a big use in the rise of AI. So you might have heard of things like ChatGTP or DeepL. They're very, we are at the moment permitting their use but they must be, um, referenced properly and many exams or many assessments will often will also um, explicitly forbid them. It's also worth noting that use of translation software, so Google Translate, um, DeepL, any of the AI translation tools must also be referenced in most cases. So if you've done your assignment in a different language and then translated into English, please also include that as a reference because lots of these translation tools can modify the language in a way that means it's not no longer original and it can be in can without realizing you can be committing misconduct so look thank you very much for listening and best of luck with your studies i'm sure i won't meet any of you again i'm sure you're all very well behaved but if you ever have any questions please just talk to your teacher that's the best way to find out and look now i'll introduce uh mitch mcburney who is the director of marketing and experience at arc Is this your phone? There you go. Hey everyone, so nice to meet all of you. My name is Mitch and I work for your student organization, ARC, which means I work for you. I'm at your service. Let me know if you do need anything. But it's my absolute pleasure today to tell you all about the wonderful things that you can do at UNSW that is outside of the classroom. Now you've made a great decision. You've come to a wonderful university with a wonderful academic experience. And that's all well and good, but when you're not doing assessments and when you're, when you're not doing your readings, when you're not in class, we also want you to have a wonderful time while you're at uni. And I'm going to tell you about all the different ways to do that. We have a mission at ARC, and it may be mission impossible, but I think it's mission possible, which is to create the best student experience. And it's really important to tell you that because each of you is different. Each of you comes from a different background. You have different experiences. You have different passions, curiosities, fears, interests whatever it might be, and that makes you unique, which means that your student experience needs to be incredibly unique as well. 
And we have this thing at ARC where we want to encourage you to find your thing, which means go out there, try a whole bunch of different stuff. This is your time while you're at university to get outside of your comfort zone, to try something completely different, and um, to have a lot of fun along the way. And in the spirit of having some fun along the way, I have a challenge for you, and there are prizes. I want you to turn to the person next to you, or someone you haven't met, and I want you to introduce themselves and find out one hobby or interest that they might have. Ready, set, go. All right, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm sure you want to keep having a conversation, but in the spirit of rewarding you for your confidence and putting yourself outside of your comfort zone, I have exclusive ARC Find Your Thing socks available. And if you can tell me the name and the hobby of the person next to you, you can win a pair of socks. Yes, sir. Wow, impressive, Rachel. Uh, two more. Yes. Kevin or Gavin? Kevin and his hobbies are? Photography. Excellent. Very wholesome. Nice. And I'll take one more. I'll oh, write up the back. You know I can't throw that far. Okay, fine. Let's try. Amazing. Thank you so much. That's so awesome. All right. I'm going to tell you about all of the really fun stuff that ARC does, so make sure you take lots of notes. This is very good um, to practice for next week, right? Um, the first thing that I get to tell you all about is all of the wonderful clubs and societies that we have at UNSW. We have over 300 different clubs and societies, everything you can possibly imagine. I believe uh, that one of the most recent clubs to join the fold is the Frozen Desserts Appreciation Society. They just eat ice cream. Um, we also have a Taylor Swift Appreciation Society. They listen to Taylor Swift. Um, but you can join the Business Society. You can join the Vietnamese Students Association. You can join the Soccer Club. There's heaps of different societies. I always recommend to students that you join at least three societies each term and try to actively participate in them. One related to your studies. So you might join the Business Society or the Accounting Society, Mechatronic Engineering Society. I suggest that you join up to a club or society of something that you know that you'll love. So we have a running society. We have a photography society. We don't have a sleeping society. I'm really sorry about that, Quinn. Um, but join up to something that you know that you'll love. And third, I want you to join a club that puts you outside of your comfort zone. This could be the term when you try Latin dance. This could be the term when you try something completely new for the first time. So give yourself that challenge. You can visit all the different clubs and societies online and on the main walkway this week and next week. The next thing that I get to tell you about is sport. And we all know that a healthy body supports a healthy mind. So if you are a student at UNSW, we want you to get your body moving. You don't have to be the next Olympic athlete, but we've got lots of ways that you can get involved in sport. I tend to recommend for students to join up to different sports clubs. We've got 40 different sports clubs, lots of really cool Australian sports like AFL or netball, or you might want to join one of our martial arts sports clubs. At UNSW, we have the oldest, largest, and most successful judo club in the country. We have the oldest, largest, and most successful taekwondo club in, in the country. We have the oldest and largest Mai Tai club in the country as well. There's so many different ways that you can get involved, and also punching things is a great way to get rid of stress as well. The next thing that I want to tell you about is getting involved. And there are lots of other ways that you can get involved. You can get extra uh, credit for being involved in these things. You can gain skills which help you professionally. But also you get all of the warm and fuzzies of doing some good in the world and making the world a better place. We've got a volunteering program called Volunteers United. We've got lots of programs dedicated to making the community at UNSW the best it can be. You can grow urban gardens on campus with our producers program. And also you can get creative, whether that's making videos or podcasts or doing writing through any of our different creative programs as well. 
We have this thing at ARC which we call wellness, which you might have been exposed to as well-being or mental health. But basically, wellness, we believe, is a skill. And it's a skill that you develop over time. You don't just wake up one day and you're like, yes, I'm really good at looking after myself. We want you to develop the skill of wellness over time, and we want you to leave this university with more skills to do with your own wellness than how you started. So we've got lots of really fun events on campus where you can like learn about wellness and I believe Pat Alpacas, which was really fun last term. Um, lots of resources online which you can access, and we also support students undertaking mental health first aid because we want you to be able to look after each other as well as you can look after yourself. Which brings me to a very important point, and you've heard of lots of wonder from lots of really great speakers today talking about how UNSW is eager to look after you, and ARC plays our part in this as well. And we know that for most students, your time at university is easy, but for one in 10 students, tricky things happen along the way. And it's not your fault, and it's really important to know that. It might not happen to you, but it might happen to someone that you sit next to. It might happen to the person that you've introduced yourself to today. And if you have the knowledge to help others, you also have the knowledge to help yourself as well. So we have the Food Hub on campus. It's accessed by over a 1,000 students every single week, which gives out free groceries to UNSW students. That's things like rice, milk, pasta, crackers. There's My Muscle Chefs there, which are really cheap from them, and I have to pay bloody $12 for them from the grocery store. But you can get them for free. So Go to Food Hub whenever you need to. We want you to make sure that you're eating well because if you eat well, you can participate in student life. The next thing is that we have legal and advocacy. If you ever have any trouble to do with tenancy, employment, uh, your visa, anything academic advocacy related at UNSW, you might have felt um, unfairly treated, which can happen every now and again. Come and talk to us. We have independent, confidential lawyers who will support you in any action that you need while you're a student at UNSW. We have the Student Representative Council and the Postgraduate Representative Council um, that you should definitely check out. They run heaps of cool events. They've got heaps of wonderful services, and they've got really nice students there as well. And the last thing on my list is that we have a new program this term. You are the first cohort to experience it. It's called Campus Compass, and it's um, students supporting students um, getting you set up for the term. So we will go through a checklist of everything you need to be set up for the term, um, and they will support you in anything that you're having a little bit of trouble with. It's out on the main walkway every day this week and every day next week, and you can book in online as well. And then we have this thing which is like heaps more because we do heaps of other things for students to make your time at university amazing. We take students on trips and tours around the, uh, around the state, around the city. We do a uh, free stationary handout all the time. We have a bike service for you and we have got room hire as well. And we have a program that runs for international students every Thursday called Culture Cafe. You get free snacks and you get to find out about another person's culture. Lots of people love it. It's really fun. And my last thing to do is if you haven't joined up to ARC already, it's free to join. You can join up right now, and then you can come visit me down on the main walkway. You can get free socks. Yes, there's more free socks. You can get a membership pack. You can get a planner, um, and you'll be ready to start off at university in the best way you possibly can. It's been so wonderful to meet all of you. Have a lovely day, a lovely O week, and a lovely time at UNSW. Thank you. First off, a big thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I know today's presentation covered a lot of different topics, so make sure you follow our peer mentor guides who are wearing purple t-shirts outside to the International Student Welcome Center, where this afternoon you can enjoy some free snacks, speak to our culture mentors, and visit our information stalls if you have any further questions. Medibank, health and well-being, student support, let's communicate, and ARC are there waiting for you, so feel free to say hi and hit them with any questions you may have. There's also a cool VR experience that you can check out, which is run by Immersive Technologies Department at UNSW. As a thank you for your attendance here today and to welcome you to UNSW, our surprise for you is that we are giving, out, giving you early access to claim your free UNSW hoodie. Please note that there is one hoodie per person and only available to full degree international students who start in 2023 only. There will be other activations and activities happening in the Welcome Center throughout this week and next, including a speed friending session to help you meet and chat with lots of new friends. Sign up in the Welcome Center when we head down. You can also check out our International Student Life page where you will find useful information updated regularly. Make sure you take advantage of all the offerings that are available. The recording of this event will also be made soon on the International Student Life page. 
Thank you for joining us today and welcome to UNSW.